Hey, what's up guys? My name is Cherno. Welcome back to my C++ series. So today we're gonna to be talking all about iterators. This is gonna serve as more of an introductory video to iterators. A lot of people have been asking me, what are iterators? Should I be using iterators? Have they been somewhat replaced in the language? This especially comes up a lot in universities who are still maybe not using the latest C++ standard. In fact, a lot of people message me and say, help me, my university is using C++03, which is a shame because it's 2020, but we're not gonna get into the educational system in this video. The point is, what are iterators? And do I really need to know how to use them? So iterators are essentially a way for you to iterate over a collection of elements. Now, the thing is, an iterator is really up to the implementation in terms of how it's used, meaning that I could write a class called Apple and then add an iterator to it. That might not make sense to you, but I could use it in some kind of special way. It's kind of like operator overloading. You can make the plus plus operator do anything. But for the most case, if we look at the standard C++ library, we can see that iterators are usually used for iterating over data structures. So whether that be a simple array that you want to traverse or get through every element in that array, maybe you have a vector, you wanna go backwards through every element. Maybe you have something a little bit more complicated like a set or a map or even a tree data structure. I want to traverse that. How do I do that? Well, you need to use an iterator. It's really easy to overlook iterators when you're just dealing with a simple data structure like a vector because we can simply use the index operator. Using the square brackets, we can simply stick a value into there and retrieve that element at that given index. But this doesn't always work for other data structures such as sets, which don't really contain all of our elements in order. So anyway, long story short, because I honestly think this does not need to be complicated at all, iterators are used to iterate over a collection of elements. And iterating over them is really simple as we'll see in a minute. But first, you know what isn't stuck in 2003 in terms of education? Skillshare. For those of you who do not know what Skillshare is, Skillshare is an online learning platform, a community of people who come together to learn a new skill on the internet. Whatever it is that you're trying to learn, whether that be illustration, photography, marketing, business, productivity, literally almost anything. Skillshare has thousands of amazing classes for you to choose from. And I love the fact that they're all really concise and simple and to the point. Even if you don't need to learn a new skill, I mean, I didn't think that I wanted to learn about illustration, but to be honest, it's been helping me relax so much, which I feel is really needed these days. Something like productivity. It, it's not something that you necessarily always set out to learn, but if you, if you come across a class that teaches you to be more productive, why not spend a few minutes going through that? And you can do that with Skillshare because of those concise classes. Coming in at just under $10 a month for an annual subscription, it is an amazing offer, but an even better offer is the fact that Skillshare is offering the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description below and sign up two free months of Skillshare Premium. That's two whole months to check out the wide variety of courses that they have on that platform and decide for yourself if you wanna stay and learn more or not. Huge thank you as always to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Let's dive in and take a look at what iterators are all about. So as mentioned earlier, iterators are used to iterate over a collection of data. Now you can really interpret this however you like. It's possible to write custom iterators that do a whole range of things, but usually when we think of an iterator, we think of having a collection of values such as this vector here. And we want to traverse the entire collection, part of the collection, maybe we want to go backwards through the collection. We essentially have the desire to get through at least some of the values inside this collection. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at some simple examples. We have a vector here. We have five values. How do I print them all out to the console? There are a number of ways we could of course do that. The most common way, which you'll probably think of, is a for loop that simply iterates through values.size like this so that we go through all of the five values that we have here. And then we simply use the index operator here with the i variable to just retrieve the data at a particular index inside our array here. So if I print this out into the console like this, and I'll add in a little scn.get over here, 
we should see one, two, three, four, five being printed out to the console. And you can see that's what we get. So we've essentially iterated through this entire collection. And this is a pretty common way of doing that. Now let's also look at another way that we might do this because we don't really need this I variable. Is there a cleaner way that we can write this? And of course there's something called a range based for loop since C++ 11. So what we can actually do is write the data type here, which is int, a name for the current element that we're iterating over. And then finally, the actual collection, which in this case is values. So in other words, we're going through all of the values here. And then we now have this integer value to play with. That's our current values I equivalent. So we can just simply print that out to the console like this. And well, you can see that that, that results in some very, very clean code. This is usually my preferred way of iterating through collections if I don't need that I variable. And there you can see we have the same result as before. So how does this even work? I mean, it looks like seemingly magic code and it seems to work for this vector class. So what exactly makes it work with the vector classes? The vector class contain something specific that makes this range based for loop work. And how does that work? So the answer is yes, it has something called an iterator. Now we're not really going to get into this too much. There's a lot of different types of iterators here. And we're actually going to even have a look at writing our own iterators for our custom data structure classes in the future. But today we're just going to discuss how it actually works in practice and how you can use it. Basically a range based for loop works because the vector class provides a begin and end function which returns an iterator at a particular position. So in other words, this is really just some shorthand code for the more extended version, which we're going to take a look at here. So if we were to write this out, you'll see that SCD vector with that template specialization of int actually has another type inside it called iterator. And there's a few different ones as you can probably see here. There's iterator, there's reverse iterator, there's const iterator. So just the regular iterator is what we can use to iterate through the values in a forward fashion and forward direction from beginning to end. Reverse iterator will do the opposite. It will actually start at the end and go back to the beginning. And then the const versions of these are the same, but we can use it on a const vector because it's not going to actually let us affect the values. It's not gonna let us mutate the values, just simply read them. So if we just select the normal iterator, that's what we have here. How can we use this to iterate through all of the variables or all of the elements inside this std vector? Well, you'd write a for loop just like you did here. So we'd have an iterator, we can call it it, that's a common name for it, for iterator. And we'll set this to the beginning of our collection, which is gonna be value values.begin. Then we need to check the end condition. So in other words, just like with any other for loop, at what condition does this for loop break? At what condition does it terminate? So it terminates if this iterator, or rather at what condition does it not terminate, right? So this for loop will run as long as this statement is going to be true. So as long as the iterator is not equal to the end of this collection. So values.end will return an iterator that is actually already outside of the accepted range. It's basically an invalid iterator. So this is not really the end, it's not the last element, it's the element after the last element, if that makes sense. And then finally, we need to write iterator plus plus. You can also write it as plus plus iterator or as a postfix as well, iterator plus plus, it doesn't matter in this case. Now let me just slightly clean up this code and drop it down a bit so that you can see it all. Okay, so that's it. We're going through all of our values. So now that we have an iterator though, how do we get the value at that iterator position? Well, you have to dereference the iterator as if it was a pointer. This works because they've just implemented this dereference operator kind of asterisk function inside the actual iterator class. Okay, so now to print this out to the console, we'll follow the same strategy as before. We simply dereference the iterator and print it out like this. And now what we should see is our one, two, three, four, five elements being printed for the third time. And that is of course what we see over here. Great. So why would you ever use iterators like this? And to be honest, the answer is you probably wouldn't these days because a range based for loop is essentially shorthand for this. And of course it looks a lot cleaner. However, there are certain situations where you might want to manipulate the position of the iterator. A good example is if you want to erase an element, but still keep iterating over the rest of the collection. In that case, the iterator gets invalidated. You have to deal with that. Or maybe you want to insert something into the middle based on a certain condition. There's a few different scenarios in which you just simply can't use this because it just wouldn't work. You need to be able to manipulate the position of the iterator. And we'll probably get into those in a future video. But obviously for something like a vector or an array with an index operator that simply takes in a numerical index, it just ascends like it would for an array here, 
they're not really necessary. You don't actually have to write code like this because we can, of course, just write a normal for loop and use i as the index. However, iterators are essentially mandatory for other types that don't have such a simple indexing system. Because of course, not everything is just a contiguous array with an index like we have here. I mean, think of something like a tree data structure. How do we traverse through a tree? We can't just increment an index. What about an unordered set? I mean, that contains a bunch of unordered elements. If I wanted to print all of them out to the console, how would I do that? The example I'm gonna show you is specifically the unordered map here. So an unordered map is essentially a hash map. It obviously doesn't store its variables in any kind of order. And we need to actually know the keys of the entries if we want to get the values out of there, unless we iterate through them. And that's what we're going to do here. So let's create a little map here. I'm going to just write an unordered map of std string to maybe int. We'll call this map. So maybe this will like contain like some kind of name like Cherno and maybe an associated score. So we'll write Cherno5 and maybe, I don't know, C++2 because obviously I'm cooler than C++. So with this map in mind, if I wanted to iterate through it, how would I do it? Well, obviously I can't use a for loop like this because if I did that, well, my index would just be like zero or one if I checked the map size and that's not what I need. I need to actually iterate using the correct keys here. So I'm forced to write some sort of iterator. So let's write this out as a for loop that actually uses iterators. So what I'll do is I'll take the entire type and you can see it's getting quite long and then maybe I don't wanna like modify these values. I just wanna access them. So I wanna use a const iterator. Okay, this is a huge type. And because of that, it's pretty common to use either a type def or using along with the type. So in other words, maybe I could replace this part of it if I wanted to and just call it a score map. And then that would obviously simplify things a lot. So I can just do this now. Maybe I even want to define some kind of score map const iterator or something like that. I could also do that by just assigning this to score map const iterator. And now all I have to do is write code like this. I honestly end up doing stuff like this a lot. I don't, I don't ever really use using with iterators like this, but I do use it with the type sometimes. So I'll leave it like that here and then just implement this as score map const iterator. So iterating through this map, I'll set the iterator equal to the beginning of the map, of course, like I did before. I'll make sure that it iterates until we reach the end of the map and then I'll increment the iterator. Now, this is a little bit different because this is a map. I'm iterating through a map. So how does that work? I don't just have one element, right? Like I would with like a set or a vector or an array or something like that. I actually have two elements, the key and the value. So how do I access them? Well, instead of just dereferencing it, you can actually use the arrow operator and access two little elements here. We have first and second. First is going to be the key. So I can just go ahead and assign that to key like that. And then the second one is going to be my value. And I'll just use the ampersand here to get this as a reference so that I'm not actually copying the value. So I have iterator first and iterator second. Let's go ahead and print that out to the console. We'll print the key followed by an equal sign and then value like this. Let's go ahead and run this. And in fact, what I might do is just take away the other code that we had here to keep our console nice and clean. All right, check this out. So we have Cherno equals five and C++ equals two. Cool, we're able to iterate through all of this. Now, how can we maybe improve this code to make it a little bit better? How can we use the same kind of range-based for loops, but with a map? Well, let's check that out. So I'm going to write for auto KV, that's gonna stand for key value in this case and then map. Yeah, it's that simple. So what this will do is actually retrieve this pair, this iterator first and iterator second. If you actually look at what it is, it's an SCD pair. So this is us now retrieving that SCD pair. And now we can actually access the elements from within that. So I still need this, unfortunately, but this obviously cleans up the code because I can just do kv.first and kv.second like that. And then obviously if I print this out, I should get the same result. Let me just add some end lines between this and here maybe. Let's see what we get. All right, as you can see, we get the same result obviously, but this again looks a lot cleaner. Now, can we do better than that? Well, yes, we can. As of C++ 17, we're able to use structured bindings. What that means is that this code is going to look even cleaner. We can actually retrieve this key and value right here inside this statement. We can simply write auto key value with these kind of square brackets here and iterate through our map. So if I drop this over here, 
that, that's all we end up with. And if I hit F5, there we go. We're now iterating through this map three different ways. And of course this code looks much, much cleaner. Now keep in mind that you will have to make sure that your compiler supports C++17 and that you're actually compiling with that. If we go into properties here as an example, you can see that my C++ language standard under C, C++ and language in Visual Studio is set as C++17. If you're getting compiler errors, which is quite common, then make sure that you're actually compiling with C++17. Okay, so in summary, the only way that we can iterate through a map or a set or something that is essentially unordered and doesn't have a simple kind of incrementing index system is by using an iterator. And today we've discussed both using a normal iterator, a const iterator, range-based for loops, which actually use iterators, as well as structured bindings with maps, which is pretty cool. And just to be super clear, the reason these range-based for loop shortcuts work is because we have an actual begin function inside our map or inside our, well, whatever collection or data structure we're using that actually ret returns an iterator in the first place. If we didn't have that, then that would in fact not work. Okay, so hopefully that was a good introduction to iterators. There is of course a lot more topics that we can actually cover in terms of iterators. I would like to, for one, write our own iterators and we'll be adding them to the data structures that we've been going over the last few episodes of this series series as well. As I mentioned, there's also some advanced things that you can try to do with iterators. And I would encourage you to try that out as an exercise, as homework, if you will. So for example, try and remove an element from the center of a vector and see if you can adjust the iterator to deal with that. And likewise, maybe add an element into the middle of the vector and see if your iterator can deal with that. Those are great exercises and I might be revealing those solutions in the future. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, as always, please do not forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you are new to this channel. We've got plenty more C++ videos coming soon. Next time, I think we'll have a go at actually writing our own iterators and adding them to our data structure classes. But until then, I hope you guys have a great day. Definitely don't forget to check out Skillshare using the link in the description below. And I will see you next time. Goodbye.